Hello everyone, welcome to Fableheim, an acolyte of the altar. I have been provided a key to take a look at this upcoming roguelike deck builder inspired by Magic the Gathering and Shadow of the Colossus releasing on March 25th. So thanks for the key. If you'd like to find out more about the game, you can find a link to the Steam page in the description down below. But uh, I was quite intrigued when I read Magic the Gathering and Shadow of the Colossus. And um, so far it's been a lot of fun. The way that you choose your character is based on your greater patron and your lesser patron. Fans of Monster Train uh, will find some similarity here between the major clan and minor clans. There are the Ravagers, the Empiricists, and the Sylvans. The greater patron will give you a passive. So the Ravagers start with a 1-1 Vent Crawler. The Empiricists heal by 3 life after each combat instead of the typical 1. And the Sylvans make it so gifts, which are kind of like your relics, um, have one less burden. Additionally, this uh, each of these greater patrons will provide you with one like bonus starting card that is usually their like weakest um, special class. The lesser patron just gives you access to another deck type and will start your or give you three of their weakest minion in your starting deck. Now, of course, if you are familiar with Magic: The Gathering, this is basically red, blue, and green. And yes, you can indeed go mono blue and laugh. They are uh, they are different and unique in their own way, but their general playstyle is kind of the same. So, I'm going to be going with the Empiricists today, but I'm not going to do Mono Blue. I'm not going to be that cruel to the AI, although it is hilarious. We'll be playing with the Empiricists, with the Ravagers as our lesser patron, because the Empiricists are Giga Chads in the late game and uh, suffer quite a bit in the, in the early game. If you are interested, I don't know what the purpose of this would be right now, but there is a way to make the game more difficult. These are like additional modifiers to raise the right level, uh, whatever that means. For this episode, we're just going to go in to the basic difficulty with the blue-red Shinani guns. There are, I believe, 12 levels, and the goal is just to get through the levels, fight the big bad enemy. This is where the Shadow of the Colossus influence comes in. And um, collect all the offerings to alter, offer to our primary patron. The picture over here on the left or right, excuse me, is our character, and this will change based on whoever your primary patron is. So the way this works, we plop down a card. We start with one mana, and it goes up to ten, just like in Arstone, Shadowverse, Rune Terra, you pick it. And with every turn that passes, our opponent here, the Mother of Kid, will, um... Is it called Rage? Gain these little pips here. So right now, all that the Mother of Kid can do is Bite, which deals two damage. If I didn't have a minion here, it would attack me. And that would have hurt. In three turns, I'll be able to ram, and in five turns, I'll be able to bite. So uh, our poor little impling here is going to fall. That's not big of a deal. Whenever you summon a minion, you cannot attack right away. But uh, our little three winning here can smack it in the face, and then it will perish for the glory of the Dark Gods. This 1-1 one, one was a forbidden card, so this is just the free bonus card we get from our greater patron. And it is the little 1-1 one, one Chanting Cultist that gives us two Borrowed Life, which you can think of as like Shields or Barrier or eh, whatever you want. Hmm. One thing that uh, every deck, no matter what, has these little tiny Disciples. And these are just like little filter things, little 2-2s two that uh, are given to you. But after you to defeat an opponent, they will be replaced by any of the cards that you choose. So they're just a starter filler. Here's something to play. But all decks also get three mana pool koi, which I actually think are really powerful. Um, there are one one for one mana, but whenever you play them, they will consume any additional mana up to a 5-5. Five five. So they can be very, very helpful for a lot of decks that struggle um, kind of in the mid-game. I also shouldn't have done that because we're about to get wiped by Ram, which I believe knocks something to the left here. A little get bitten, Ram will come in. They'll smack each other around. Big F. My bad. <laughs> but we can get a 5-5 five, five out now. This guy's not going to die, so we can just get some free damage in. The Overlord mechanic is quite interesting. One thing I had to kind of get wrap my mind around was... You don't need to just... Attack every single turn. You could if you want to. But you don't have to. Oh, we're going to get a Ram here. I played this atrociously. <laughs> I shouldn't have played this, because the bite's going to kill this. 
Then the Ram's gonna come in and knock these two into each other. Wow. Good start, me. Good start. That's okay. We can summon our little cannon fodders. And we can play our Overlord here. Uh, the Overlord mechanic basically is whenever you don't attack with an Overlord card, its special effect will go off. And for this guy, it will give one attack to attackers. So as you can see, it's a pretty good example of you don't actually have to do anything if you don't want to. I'm just a fool who got greedy. I just like playing cards. It feels wrong if I'm not playing a card. You know? I might actually lose. We'll see. Because he's going to bite that, you're going to bite that. Then I'm going to deal two. Okay, fair enough. Then we my next turn. Easy. I took one extra damage, but remember, as an Empiricist, I'm going to heal after three combat. I'm going to take six damage. But remember, as an Empiricist, I am going to heal for three after each combat, so it's not that big of a deal. I do find the first combat to always be the hardest for um, any time I'm playing blue. And speaking of, hmm. Whenever I deal damage, gain that much borrowed life. If it is turn six or later, I have charge. Cool. So we rolled all blue stuff, but we can also get red cards from having Ravager as our lesser our lesser patron. We got our first offering. Here are the gifts. Creatures played while you have seven or more mana, max mana, summon a 1-1 one, one on death. Your spells, they cost two or less trigger ties. I'm going to take Ancient Gong. I do like this one, but I don't know if we're actually going to find spells that cost two or less. We'll see. The Angler. Oh, dear. This gets really hard. I don't like um, playing the Manicoys naked. So this guy has four abilities. And they are... Something. We'll go with something. That's what we'll say. He has the Cast Master. He will deal three uh, to a random creature every time a spell is cast. But the annoying thing here is the Lantern Lure. The Lantern Lure is that he spawns a lantern on my side of the deck. Isn't that annoying? But whenever it dies, it deals one to me? Two to me. Very rude. Now, of course, I could just keep it alive the entire time, right? Wrong. He also attacks to deal one, which of course would go left here, but then he swipes. So he's going to kill this. He's also going to deal one to everything. I could drop the Overlord. I could also just do nothing. I'll spawn this guy. It's going to die, but he'll give me my bonus life, which is fine. It'll protect me from um, the damage here. I have a hard time against this guy. And um, we can drop both disciples, sure. Next turn will be a good Lava Smith turn if we want for bonus damage, or we could do a Koi for just something with fat health. Which might be the plan, depending on what we draw here. Remember, he is going to swipe me in a few turns. You know what? Let's let's rip out the Lava Smith, because that should buff this as well. Hit him with his own Lantern. Ha! Um, we can play this. The swipe is coming in two turns, so... We'll just lose our one little Disciple here. No big deal. Now swipe his next turn. I could summon the fodder here, but we can hold it. Patience. You know, I could also play this. I will. Has five health. It's not going to die. The poor Impling and the Lantern will die, however. So, there's that. And the Lantern also reduces the damage of things near one, so... Or by one. So... Get our cannon fodders. Which is a spell, so it dealt damage. Forgot about that. But that's okay. Because I believe we have claimed victory. That wasn't too bad. This deck was well suited against this character. In my, uh... The one run that I've won. I had a really slow deck. I was blue-green and... Or excuse me, green-blue. 
There it is. Choose a card in hand. Hmm. We're going to take Eye Gouge. So Eye Gouge is what I think is the strongest card in the game. It's a classic blue card. It basically just says you never get to use this ability again. <laughs> it's so good. And there's a special green card that um, can like duplicate a spell. Well, it duplicates a card. And if it's a spell, it duplicates it twice. So you can basically make bosses do nothing to you. It's hilarious. Uh, you can hear boys' laughter. The smell of rich spices from a roaring campfire. Let's go to this event. A large man hunches over a thick metal pot. He has two tables on either side piled with ingredients. Some familiar, some comforting. Others that curdle the stomach from both appearance and scent. So I can use these beetles. I'm not actually sure what the beetles are, to be honest. Maybe they're just a currency that goes on away, but that'll give us a quick snack or a filling feast. Um. Hmm. Filling feast is, of course, more powerful. I might as well take it. They both have the same cost, and they're both forsake, so. Ideally, I hold this card in my deck, but the deck does have a hard limit of cards, so we can't go crazy here. Oh, I never fought this guy before. The Messenger Scribe. Counterattack deal one. Unlike other counterattacks, Future Strike happens before the creature deals damage. Oh, I see. So my implings are not going to live. Piercing Gaze, Starbeam, and Starbeam once again. Okay. We might hold the man with the goat head. Um, I'm just going to play the Chanting Cultist here. Basically for the Borrowed Life. The 1-1 the one, one token doesn't mean anything. Okay, what do you do? Deal 1 direct damage to your opponent. That's going to suck. And Starbeam. Deal 12. Oh! Oh. Oh. Well. What are we going to... I gouge... Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Starbeam is annoying. It's probably going to be Starbeam, right? See, if I play the man with a goat head, he's just going to die next turn. Ah. <sighs> What we'll do is we'll play with the man to go ahead, but I'm only going to I'm only going to attack this turn with the tiny disciple. But the star beam kill this. It always goes left to right. Unless um there's a frontline card. Oh, there's two star beams. Never mind. The man with the go head's gonna die. So we'll just uh, make the most of it with our little overlord. Which I should not have, because Future Strike killed that guy. There's a lot going on. Hmm. I'm definitely going to have to gouge a Starbeam. Because I'm pretty sure this will hit me if I don't have two units on the field, which is really annoying. Well. We get an Impling here to sacrifice. Now, some enemies, they have a mechanic where, like, if you don't attack them, they'll heal. But this guy does not. Thankfully, the man with the goat head, even though he did suffer a horrible death, did provide me with a lot of borrowed life. So I can tank this up. Um. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can gouge next turn. So, I mean, the Impling does literally nothing because he's just going to die to Future Strike. Unless I purge this, which I could do, I suppose. Hmm. It depends. One of the things that's very different in this game that I had to adjust to is you have a set number of cards, right? We have five cards remaining. If your deck, hand, and boards are empty, you will instantly perish. So we can't just, like, throw away our deck. If we're playing badly, we will just lose to a hard, a hard no-no. Now, I am going to go ahead and eye gouge um, Future Strength. So that I can just attack with my one, my three one. Hopefully that'll be enough to win. I hope so. My borrowed life is doing so much work. 
I've taken like what? Six or seven damage? Eight damage. Count the mana. So. But we've won. Well done. We made it. I love the the Empiricist blue or temp health. Wow, I'm getting a bunch of Empiricist stuff. Gain one max mana. I like it. Hermit, gain bonus effects when played as your only creature. Ah, I see. So there is mana manipulation in this game. I didn't know that. Um, the disciple, the possessed disciple, wouldn't be bad. This is like a mid-game card, right? Which is my greatest weakness. When you reduce my mana cost, do it three times. I think I'm going to take the Possessed Disciple here. Because I, the whole reason I went Ravager with my my lesser patron was to get like an early game uh, advantage. At a temporary Earth Carver's turn to hand, it reads 2 mana. Grant a creature 2 health, it cannot attack. Your units with 7 or more attack gain 3 mana. We're not there yet, but there are quite a few cards that I would like to get, so we'll take that. As you can see, as we take gifts, we gain more Spiritual Burden. I have no idea what Spiritual Burden does. Not even a little bit. The Unheeded Messenger. Message from above. Sends a letter to your hand. Read it carefully. That's not ominous. And then we have Slash. And another Starbeam, and then Calamity. Right. A friendly letter. Hover to read the letter. You cannot end your turn while you hold this card. Acolytes, we need not fight yet. Let us rest a while first. It is not safe here, but I will keep watch. Okay. Cool. Well, I suppose we'll just dump all my damage on the deck. The field. And, um, try and do stuff, I guess. I hope this slash isn't an AoE. I really hope it's not. We'll take some temp HP from our one little cultist friend. And we'll smack. Smack that. All on the flow. Don't AoE me, please. Deal three. Okay. That was a good draw. The fauna here are sick with wolf flung. Drink this, please trust me. Listen to the messenger, take five damage. Gain full 30 beetles, fully advanced opponent's rage gauges. Ah, uh, no, we'll take five. No, no, I'm good. Uh, fully advancing the opponent's rage gauge would mean we instantly get calamity, which I'm going to just assume full clears my deck. There is a, an ability that does that. I believe it's called the White Void. There are a few here, or uh, bosses that have that. Uh, let's get the Possessed Disciple on the field. It's more attack if we don't attack with the Overlord. Next turn. Hmm. Begin Man with the Goat headed up. Depending on what this says. So we're three turns away from Calamity. I'd really rather not take five again, but I can. Because we have Filling Feast if we want to use it. And now... I should have played this first. That's okay. We have Man with a Go Head. Because it's turn six or later, it will have charge, so it can instantly attack. You'll love to see it. And, um... I think we've done it. I'm going to lose my Overlord, unfortunately, but... I'm going to hold the Filling Feast. I don't actually know if the Filling Feast takes a slot in my deck. I hope it doesn't. I'm just going to hit it with everything. Screw you, unheated messenger. Okay. Ooh, another man with the goat head. I've been a huge... I really like this card. We'll take it again. Why not? I'm surprised I'm not seeing any Ravager cards. Hmm. Oh, dear. 
The Hydrozoan Hive Mind. This is an interesting opponent. So this guy will summon uh, random jellyfish whenever in his empty ability slots. So he spawned the Hungry Jelly. Deal one. If this kills a creature, I gain three life. Great. Fantastic. So this is literally going to nullify itself. But the reason why I still attacked is because each of the little jellies have a uh, health bar. So they have eight health. As you deal damage to them, it'll go away, and then the jelly will die. And then it'll be eventually replaced by another one. Like this long-arm jelly, which counterattacks. <sighs> of course it does. But thankfully, it's all worked out. Deal two if this kills a creature. Deal two as another counterattack. Okay. We have the angry jelly, which just deals two. My deck is not very good against this guy, it would appear. Hmm. I could kill the Hungry Jelly, which might be the play. It's kind of a pain, to be honest, but we can do it. That kills the Hungry Jelly, so now only the Long Arm Jelly. Well, now the long arm jelly is the main one. The piercing jelly. Oh, dear. Well, at least I have temp HP for that. We get the koi out. And I'm going to deal one. Just to, you know, get that started. Maybe I shouldn't have, because now the angry jelly is going to attack this. Hmm. It is turn six, so our little man with the goat heads all have charge. Don't really have a good late game plan, do I? No, I don't. Thankfully, this will not kill the target with the long... Well, it'll kill the long arm jelly. So that's that. I'm going to take one. I'm going to deal two. The long arm jelly is back. Of course it is. Now, if I attack with everything here, the counterattack, well, maybe it won't actually. We can summon cannon fodder. Then we call this guy in. Now he does deal damage. Let's go. Proper red deck stuff. Straight to the face. Okay, that is going to go off. Fair enough. I wonder if I eye gouge. It should break the entire, like, the whole slot, right? I think so. Speaking of eye gouge, here it is. Hmm. So what I can do is I can just break this. I definitely don't want to remove Hive Mind. That actually benefits me. Now to get rid of the long arm jelly. And I believe... Look at all my temporary hedge points. So good. That third slot can simply not be filled anymore. I hope. Let's get the charge going. And that's a glorious kill. If you were going to tell me that I was going to play an Empiricist deck like a Ravager deck, I don't know if I would have believed you. If you've played no creature cards, this battle destroy an enemy ability. Huh. Interesting. If Awakened, create a base copy of me. Oh, interesting. So Awakened, uh, you become Awakened once all enemy rage gauges have been filled and all their abilities are active. So by turn 8, this is almost guaranteed to exist. I would just fill my, my board with 4-4s. Four That's funny. I don't think Divine Execution is going to work for us. While this would be really powerful, um, this is kind of like if you have spells in your deck, right? So none of these are particularly great. I am going to reroll. There are some Ravager cards. 
I told you you could get Ravager stuff. Summon a crumbling gargoyle. Oh, I know what those are. We're going to take the Wildfire Drake. This will be a mid-game card for us. I think it'll be good fun. A strange-looking man is crouching out of sight. Sure. The Trixie Hunter. Still as stone. Still as stone. The man mutters, holding his spear close to his chest. Before him graze a group of small, fuzzy creatures and their much larger mother. Soup of bones, soup of bones. He says. He raises his spear and begins to charge. Which do you help him hunt? So you can hunt the mother to gain another, um, killing piece. We'll hunt the other creatures. That's fine. That brings us back to full. The Maestro Maev. Oh, well, this fight is hard. This actually killed me on my first, my first run. My first uh, scientific run. So we're here for science. Speaking of. Harry, deal one. This is going to be familiar, isn't it? We also have the piercing gaze, which deals one to me. And the soothing song, which restores one life to itself. Now, the reason why this is tough is because of Crescendo. We do have the eye gouge, but I don't have any mana manipulation, so. I'm going to have to wait until turn eight. Now, I could just run it down. But because he's going to heal... Go hold. So here's the crescendo. Empower all other abilities, raising their effects by plus one. So every time this goes off, Harry will now deal two. Here's the gaze will now deal two. Soothing song will now heal two. And so on and so forth. So yeah. That's um That's the danger here. I don't want to play anything. I mean I can play this. I'm going to take one. That's from Piercing Gaze, of course. So what I could do... I could not attack until I just eye gouge parry, and then I can just run everything into his face. Because the cannon fodders will... In well, they won't instantly die. These things will die. Is that okay? That's acceptable. I can't not do anything. Well, I suppose I could. But I do think I'm going to have to crescendo parry. Or, <clears throat> I gouge parry. You could say, but Faye, piercing gaze is hurting you. It is hurting me. However, that. Counterpoint, that. I legit think that's what I'm going to do. So we're just going to fill our board with stuff. Take it easy. And then, uh, in two turns, we break the parry, we run his face. Unfortunately, he is healing, but... Pain and suffering. And remember, I do heal for three after every combat as well. So let's plop down a man with the goat head. And I'll run this in just to get some temporary health. And then I can play this on the next turn. Now we counter the parry. By counter, of course, I mean I gouge the parry. And now it's GG for Maestro Maev. Patience. Skill. Contemplation. GG. Do I want to use Filling Gaze? I don't think I need to. Or Filling Feast, I don't think I need to. Boom. I didn't even need the man with the goat head. Whenever you gain borrowed life, gain two more. I believe that's why he only while he's on the field, right? Ooh, Valdrada, the Grand Lich. Yep. Oh, the Filling Feast is filling up my deck. Hmm. Unfortunate. Finger of an impling. So this is the max deck size. I don't know if it's possible to make the deck larger. But this is as big as it gets. So 
unlike in a lot of roguelike deck builders, let's get rid of an impling, where you can like control the size of your deck. It could be as big as you want, as small as you want. Um, this game, you want every card. Ooh, increase starting hand size. That's three spiritual burden. Each of my creature strikes for exactly one damage game, one borrowed life. I have one card that does one. We'll take this. My spiritual burden is yellow. What does that mean? I have no idea. Does it make the game harder? Maybe. The Crumbling Mountain. Oh, hey, look. Obliterate. That sounds bad. <laughs> I have fought this guy before. So he has the Rage of the Earth. When falling below 40 life and again at 20 life, destroy an ability to advance the other Rage Gauges by 2. Destroy an ability. Hmm. Pincer punches open up, deals one to the leftmost and rightmost enemy, and it can hit the same target. Fair enough. I think I'll play this guy just for the life. Again, he's going to die. It's okay. It doesn't matter. They are but fodder for the Dark Gods. I never talked about what Wildfire does. It's good fun. Wildfire deals 2 to 3 damage each turn randomly. Afterwards, has a very small chance to spread to another ability. That is one of the magical effects of the Ravagers. If I don't play a card, I take 2. I am debating playing the Lava Maw. But you know what we'll do? We'll play 3-3. Three, three. That's fine. Make sure I can smack it for 3 before it kills him. There's Veldrada, the Grand Lich. This kills all creature and then it revives them. Then summon Possessed Disciples until your board is full. Good stuff. No matter what I do, the fish is dead. It's a sad thought. But we'll bring this guy into the field. Which will, at the very least, protect my health. At the very least. Uh, shall we get a drink going? Sweeping Strike is about to open up. It has wild-fired pincer punches. Now, I'm not sure what happens if you have wildfire on all abilities. Like, can you keep adding it? I don't know. I do know there's a combo where you can add wildfire and then ignite it. I also know we have eye gouge in my hand. And that's pretty spicy. You know what else is spicy? And HP. Okay, Rage of the Earth. Destroyed that to open Obliterate. Deal two to all damage. Oh. No. It's fine. You know what's really funny? He doesn't know what's about to happen. He has no idea what's about to happen. But you know what's going to happen. Obliterate deal six with overkill. An ability with overkill will deal leftover damage to the opponent directly. That's me. Well, what a shame. That would suck if it came through. Ah. Uh. Ah, oh, well. No fun allowed. <laughs> and with Rage of the Earth, he has destroyed his final ability. Ladies and gentlemen, the mono blue. Strike, well, I mean, not mono blue, but the, the blue deck strikes again. <laughs> I love eye gouge. Eye gouge is great. Ah, speak of the devil and it shall appear. Now, I don't know if I want two of these. Advance all enemy rage gauges by one. End of turn, if awakened, gain fire borrow life. Ah, who am I talking about? Let's take two. Um. I mean, I don't need two lava maws, although they are pretty nifty. I'm ready to get rid of this filling feast, but I feel like I need to hold this, you know? You're of an impling. They're not very useful. The Shambling City. This is an interesting fight. Oh, that's a dead turn one. So the Shambling City has a residence. The Shambling City still has a few frail souls caring for its ruins. 
And uh, as you can see, it has a little bit of a health bar. So we punch him, it lowers the number. And he will deal damage times the number of remaining residents. So we're about to take five to the face, which doesn't feel good. So we must plop down a sacrifice. Good. <laughs> now, unfortunately, we're going to have to keep plopping down sacrifices until I can hit him real good. But thankfully for me, I have one. Now, he's going to open up Proselytize. This kills the weakest unit on the field and grants residence equal to its attack. So I really need to start dealing damage. And when you need to deal damage, you call the cannon fodder. So now there are no more residents remaining. He's going to proselytize one of these units. I'm not sure which. Maybe, yeah, cannon fodder. And gain two more residents. So then he'll start dealing two damage. And by start, I mean he'll do it this turn. Fair enough. You do you. Pop down that. What are we going to eye gauge here? Oh, I should eye gauge, eye gauge that. That is not a good card. This is the White Void. I mentioned this earlier. This will destroy all units on the field. And it looks to me like he's going to get it right before I can do anything about it. Titanic Strike is coming in. This is deal 5 overkill. He's going to deal 5 to this unit and then it's going to hit me for 4. Which feels bad, but there's nothing I can do about that. Because White Void's about to open up, I don't want to play both of these. But I'll play one. Why not? Okay. Fair enough. I'm going to have to edit the music a little bit. It's getting a little loud. There's not a whole lot of sound settings right now. That actually worked out really well. I mean, I calculated that. Duh. Uh, so White Void is coming in. I think I play nothing. Because White Void's about to go off and blow up the deck. Wildfire did some damage there. Which did kill the resident. Oh, screen sprite. You know, it's going to take like eight turns to do White Void again. Maybe I break Proselytize so that he can never get more citizens back. Maybe I do that. That might have been the smartest thing I've done all day. I think it was. <laughs> um, now, we have this Titanic Strike coming in. So I'm going to eat it with my face. We'll play the Impling. So we'll take four. But then we're going to go double man with the goat head. For all of that juicy temporary HP. What a beautiful turn. It's all coming together. You try. Ooh, Valdrada, the Grand Lich. Uh, so what we can do, we can attack with these. Then we can play Valdrada. Now he will kill these creatures, then revive them. And the rest of my deck will be filled out by the Possessed Disciples. And I think he's going to die next turn. Just call it a feeling. Now, if I were to try and play a creature with my uh, deck being full here, it would just destroy it, so. We swing, we win. Even if he white voids this, all these uh, possessed disciples will come back as the tiny disciples, so. And what do you know? What if I just say, no. No fun allowed. But see, my deck ran out during that. That was the final card in my deck. Play. Give me five, five, minus five, minus five this round. So this is a Ravager card that's quite interesting. Hmm. The idea, right, is that we play this on turn four and it's a two, two. 
And if it survives, next turn it'll be a 7-7, seven, seven, which is a lot. I wonder if it'll then get the bonus damage from my relic. I could try it. I could also just get another cannon fodder, which is pretty cool. I could also skip. We could also re-roll. Wow. I mean... Why not? <laughs> sure! I'm down. <laughs> Let's try the dice game. A group of nomadic acolytes are playing dice. As bets are made, a small pile of golden beetles builds up in the center. A gambler can take the pot, but to do so is to exit the game. Few do, as most value the game more than their own wealth. Go for broke. Hey, look at that, we won. The Forgotten Warrior. Okay. Was the card destroyed? I don't know what that symbol was. It might have been. I hope not. If I took no damage last turn, restore 5 health. If I took 10 or more damage last turn, restore 10 health. He also has the White Void and then the Sunlight Sunlit Spear. As is often the case these days, our turn one is going to be AFKing. Deal 5 damage. Overkill damage hits both the, the next creature and you directly. That's annoying. Well. As you can see, it can be dangerous to play greedy decks the way we're doing. But it is hilarious, so... There's some pros, some cons. I wonder if Spiritual Burden reduces my... I could play the Lava Mo Sure. If it reduces my um, hand draw, and that's what that image was. Like, I'm supposed to draw six and I draw five, for example. I probably shouldn't have played that. <laughs> But thankfully, I have the Filling Feast, which I definitely need to play sooner rather than later. Because uh, it's taken a spot in my deck. Okay, so the Sunlit Spear is coming in. It's going to deal three to me and to that guy. We can... Uh... Let's heal ten if he takes ten. So we'll just hit with these two. So annoying. That's fine. We have the eye gouge coming up soon. Uh, we also have white void coming in. So... I think we just do a little bit of smack room. End our turn. Here's the white void. And I'm going to go ahead and eye gouge the Sunlit Spear, I think. No. Will the wildfire stay? Okay, so that's one downside to doing that. So what we're going to do is, this turn, we're going to play this guy. He's just going to fill my deck with Possessed Disciples. Then we're going to enter a turn. Then I'm going to eye gouge from a mid bulwark, and then we win. GG. It's beautiful. Eye Gouge is my favorite card in the whole game. Speaking of, just for safe measures. Ah, good, Anakin, good. Let the mono blue flow through you. <laughs> ah, good fun. Gain six borrowed life, discard a card. Hmm. Uh, discarding in this game is exceptionally dangerous. That's a dangerous game you play. Draw your highest card's creature, then reduce the new highest in your hand by one. I don't like any of these. Choose a card in hand. Eh. 
Team, I don't like any of this. We have an overlord for free life. I mean, I could do the profane jester. The faster I get to eight mana, the better. Reduce all the cost of all cards in hand by one. Advance the enemy rage gauges by one. That could be really dangerous. Hello. Deal 10 and inflict all enemy abilities with wildfire. This actually has anti-synergy with, um... Eye gouge. Deal 2 damage to all allied creatures. Any that would die this way are instead restored to full health and a grant to attack. Fearless. Fearless creatures gain more attack depending on the base max life of the enemy plus 10%. The base max life. So this guy could be a 3 mana 8 4. Could be. That seems pretty good. I kind of want to try a wave of lava. I've never seen it before. Let's try it. And we'll remove one of the lava, the lava moths. I feel like the koi are just so good. Oh, hey. We're at the altar. Cool. We made it to the ends. Oh. Hi. Um, this isn't who I fought at the altar in my one successful run. Haru is the god of the Sylvans. I didn't realize you were fighting the other gods. The cycle. Counterattack. If your opponent controls only one creature, kill it. Oh. Unify. Coalesce all creature stats into the one with the highest attack. Okay. Ice Mirror. Deal damage directly to your opponent equal to their largest creature's attack. 12. Am I about to die? <laughs> I think I'm about to die. No. I need to eye gouge that. Storm gaze. Add one infestation token if I was not struck by a creature last turn. Deal direct damage equal to the total infestation amounts. Now. Oh. And then we have one more ability coming in. The Strangling Roots. When your opponent plays a spell, negate the activation of that card and destroy this ability. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to have to sacrifice. I can sacrifice Swarm them or the... I don't want to play a 2-2 Koi, but I'm going to. Because I now, I don't have one card only, so the cycle won't kill it. And Storm Gaze will stay at one. Oh, interesting. I feel like there's a lot of cards I need to purge here. And I couldn't tell you which one is more important. Okay. I need to keep attacking with this. I need to ice gouge before the ice mirror does, um... Oh, the Coalesce here is going to... Oh. Yeah, I'm glad I saved the Filling Feast. If I play the Filling Feast now, it'll be devoured by the Strangling Roots. I think I'm going to take this turn to play the Swarm them, which will break that. So now I'm free to play Filling Feast whenever I need it. That will prevent Storm Gaze from going up. I'm about to take five. I actually should play this this turn. Okay. Now I play Filling Feast. 
That brings us up to full health. BPMM with a goat head. To get temporary HP. And to keep the cycle going. That's one. Yeah, I need to break this. Uh, so we'll Lava Wave. That'll deal 10, and it will put Wildfire on these four abilities. And we smack, get more 10 HP. And I think we win. I took 11 there, but I don't care. Yep, we won. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, GG. G. I don't even need an eye gouger. I have three eye gougers and it doesn't even matter. Farewell. Get overgrown tree hugger. Actually, that's probably just a tree. Not a tree hugger. The Acolyte's journey completed. Nest dissected the offerings of flesh. Nest or Knest? At last... Their siblings cull from every field and forest. No one was left to call divine reason in to question. That ending changes based on which of the patrons were your primary patron. And as you can see, we, of course, were the best primary patron. The blue deck. The empiricists. But that, my friends, was Acolyte of the altar. I hope you enjoyed this early look at it. The game is releasing on March 25th. There may still be a demo up uh, for the game in the Steam page, which of course you can find a link to in the description down below if you are interested. If you'd like to see more, feel free to let me know. I'll probably take a look, a run through the other two major patrons as well, the blue deck, or the green deck, and the Sylvans and the uh, Ravagers. But uh, feel free to let me know. I quite enjoy this game. I think it's really chill. It's one of the easier... Um, roguelike deck builders out there because there's not a whole lot of like major deck management you just fill your deck with good stuff you try and counter out the beast actions and if you're playing of course with the blue deck uh, you just eye gouge and win seems fair enough but thanks for watching I hope you enjoyed thank you to the patrons and the channel members who support the channel I greatly appreciate you if you'd like to stay up to the channel feel free to join the description down below the discord in the description down below and I will see you next time bye